sacrifice our being, our well-being, for the profession. Because when things go, don't do well, what do coaches normally do? We work harder. And I had a, after my fifth year of coaching, I actually, I left the country and I lived in the backwoods in New Zealand. Never gonna coach again for the rest of my life. I ran out of here, said, I'm nuts, I'm out of here. And it took somebody to drag me back to the United States. So, All right, welcome everyone. I just want to um, start by saying what an honor it is for me to be here with you. Uh, I never take for granted that you're here on your own time in the off season to make yourself better. So before this talk, I, I just get so excited about spending a few minutes with you because I imagine the caliber of people in front of me and I just feel honored. So thank you for being who you are and I understand what it took for you to get here today. Um, what I want to talk to you about is something that I teach professionally. Um, I teach at a, a nearby college, Chesapeake College. I teach uh, in the human services field. I have a PhD in human growth and development, a master's in psychology, and uh, a bachelor's in engineering steps to help you think about self-care for the upcoming crew season. And then the third thing is I'd like you to connect with somebody. Um, I was going to do it on the way to lunch, but obviously your head's going to be down and you're going to be just in a bundled position getting there. But if you have a chance today, I'd love for you to continue the conversation with one other person and ask them what they do for self-care and where they run into stumbling blocks. To get started, um, I just want you to read this quote, and I'll be quiet for just a minute. I'm not a huge Shakespeare fan, but I really love this quote because the older I get, the more true it becomes to me. We all play different roles in our lives. You know, our life is very complicated, and life is very complicated. And as a rowing coach, you have many hats that you wear. And one of the hats is helping people. This is a recent definition of who a human service professional is. I want you to read this definition, and then I'd like you to raise your hand if any of you think you do this professionally at least part of the time. Look around the room. Look around the room at a group of human services professionals. And what I'm going to guess at the end of this talk is that many of you have not had this formal training, and yet you're put into a role of being a human service professional, right? We know it's well documented in terms of research that the stress and strain of teaching and coaching and working as a human service professional it's well documented. I've talked about this before with uh, this group and other groups with US Rowing. We don't have to beat that dead horse. What we have to do now is we have to move forward towards a solution. And even though stresses and strains are well documented in your profession, um, there's very little formal training in, with regard to self-care. And I think what happens a lot, and I'm sure you've seen colleagues, or I'm sure you've had these own thoughts in your head, is that I think this is one of the reasons that people jump ship in your profession. This is very academic, but I just wanted you to see this. This is one of the courses that I teach. It's a practicum where people go out in the workplace and they work as a human service professional. One of the things that I am graded on, I'm assessed on, and I have to assess my students on, is I help them to understand their limitations of the care of the self and the helping process. What that means is that I need to grade my students on their understanding of their own limitations. Picture that, she's laughing. This is part of our curriculum that I am graded on. How many people have come to you as a rowing coach and said to you, there are limitations on what you're gonna be able to do? How many of you have had that formal training? I'm looking at an empty room here of hands. Right? This isn't, in my opinion, fair to you guys. Because if you were trained in the human services, this is going to be one of the things we're going to make very clear to you in terms of your own limitations. Um, I love this cartoon. I don't know if you can see it in the back, but part of understanding your own limitations is understanding the need for self-care in your profession. This cartoon, for those in the back, says, the trouble with success is that the formula is the same for a nervous breakdown. As Mike mentioned, a lot of times, 
the worse you're doing in this profession, the harder you work, right? And you, you end up in that spiral. I want to give you eight very specific steps to help with self-care this spring, things that I would teach my own students. The first one, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this because it's so incredibly important in the human services profession, is the first thing is to set boundaries regarding communication with assistant coaches and your rowers and communicate it clearly. The first thing I do as a college professor, and I know my job isn't your job, your job is 24-7 many days, you travel many days, I got it. There's differences, however, there's some very clear similarities. The first thing I do on the first day of my interaction with the people that I work with, I'm very clear about when to contact me and how to contact me and the days I will not be available, right? This is my, these are my office hours. This is when you can see me in person. This is my email. These are the days I'll be checking it. This is when you can expect a response. Don't call me at 2 a.m. Don't call me at after 8 o'clock p.m., right? Again, I know you travel. That's a different story. But my guess is that some of you are available 24-7, and it's not realistic or healthy in the human services profession. The other thing I want to talk to you about setting boundaries is one of our jobs is to help professionalize our student athletes or our students in my case. Is it appropriate for you to call your boss at two o'clock in the morning with girlfriend or boyfriend drama? Is it appropriate for you to do that to your boss? No way, no way. If I get drunk and I put my hand through a glass window, you know what, I am not, should not call my boss and tell her that, mm-mm, right? That is not going to be good for my career. The same way we shouldn't set up our students to do that. Number one, if there's blood at 2 o'clock in the morning, you should not be the call. What should the call be? 911, right? You should not stand between that student and 911. You need to communicate to the student. Again, not, if you're, uh, not on the road, that's different. But if they're with their friends or whatever at 2 o'clock in the morning, they're going to jail they have put their hand through a window or they've even slipped on the ice, please call 911. The other thing is that sometimes there are mental problems in the middle of the night. I have my PhD. I teach crisis management. Almost all the time, I feel like I'm not qualified for a suicide attempt, a mental health crisis. I can pretty much guarantee, and please don't take this personally, but you're not qualified either. Again, by answering that call at 2 o'clock in the morning and not communicating if there is ever this problem on the team, please call 911. At the emergency room, there will be somebody who is trained in crisis management. And just like CPR, for things like suicide attempts, we have QPR. We have specific steps that would be taken to prevent a suicide. So again, please don't put yourself in the middle of that. Make it clear to your students who should be called when. The second thing, the specific step I want to tell you is that it's really important to make a day to shut down your computer. You need to separate yourself physically from your workplace. Look, my parents, they left their job at 5.30 or 6 o'clock or whenever they left, and that was the end of their day. And that was, I think, a healthier time for us. You have to figure it out. You know, Sundays, I'm not going to be on the computer. Maybe it's impossible for you, and in your head it's impossible. but. Be very sure of one thing, Verizon and Apple, those companies, they'd like to have us think differently, but we need to separate ourselves from our electronic devices for our own mental health, okay? The third thing is exercise. I understand I'm talking to a group of coaches who understand the physical benefits of exercise, but in the field of human growth and development, there are a lot of things we don't know. The majority of things we don't know about people because they're complicated. We do know about two things when it comes to human growth and development in terms of research. We know about smoking is bad for us, and we know that exercise is good for us. We know that exercise is particularly good for our overall sense of well-being, our mental health. Okay, Keep that in mind in terms of making time for yourself this spring to exercise. The fourth thing I'd like to tell you is that I hope that you can take time to focus on your personal as well as your professional goals. If one of your personal goals is family, you're the kind of person who starts the season and says, my family is going to be put first this season, right? Family is important to me. 
then make it happen. Some really simple suggestions. And I know that everybody's going to cringe right now because you've got to be fast, right? But take a night off a week to spend some time with dinner with your family, right? I know, you can't because you have practice. You're always going to have reasons why you can't take care of yourselves. But what we're looking at is professional sustainability over the long haul. And you need to make some of these critical decisions along the way if you want to stay uh, sharp as a professional. Another thing is plan a couple day trips this spring. And what I'd love for you to do if personal life is really a priority in your life is to spend the time you would on a crew trip planning a day with your family, right? Go to a special place. Put the energy into it that you would put in your team. That'll, that'll help you meet those goals. The fifth specific step is trust your assistant coach or your team captains. So there are a lot of advantages of this. One of the first advantages is, again, this term called professional sustainability. We talk a lot about going green and being sustainable, but I think we rarely spend the time into professional sustainability, allowing you to work throughout a lifetime and be healthy throughout a lifetime in your work and maintain your pace, right? You have to make decisions to do that. And when you give an assistant coach responsibility or you give a team captain responsibility, it not only benefits you, it benefits them. Again, it helps professionalize them. Now look, you may have to do some communication along the way, which Margie was helping you with. You may have to let your boss know, if your boss is an athletic director, you may have to have a meeting with him and her, and you need to sit down and you say, hey, I need you to know I got somebody terrific on my team. She's a senior this year. She's a marketing major. I'm going to give her some responsibility. Or, hey, I got an assistant coach who's going to have his or her own team in two years, and I'm scared to race her because she's that good. And I'd like, to, I'd like to give some stuff to her. I'd like to take Tuesday nights off. I'd like to have her have the responsibility on the of the team. It's going to give her an opportunity and will give me an opportunity. You're going to have to communicate some of these changes, but in the end, I think it's really going to benefit you. The sixth idea related to self-care this spring for you to think about is you need to understand that each small decision matters in the picture of, in the big picture of self-care. When people quit and people are really stressed out or people have a nervous breakdown, I'm sorry to say, and let's just throw it on the table, it's never about one thing. When people are in crises, they'll come to the table with a list of 20 or 30 things, right? When we, we look at stress theory, what we talk about with stress theory is a pile up of stressors. There's actually a term for it, a pile up of stressors. Because all of these decisions add up. I'm going to give you a great rowing example. I don't know how many years ago it was, probably five or six years ago. Mike started racing on Mother's Day, right? We didn't race on Mother's Day before. It's a little teeny tiny decision. It's a little teeny tiny race, whatever. It made a big impact in our family life. Mother's, Mother Day now, Mother's Day, I know it's a hallmark day, I got that, but it's a very lonely day now for me. Right? I'm home with my two kids. I'm by myself. Nobody wants to do anything because it's Mother's Day. These little decisions that you will make in your career and in the spring, it makes a difference. You have to be conscious of all the little things that you do throughout the week regarding your overall self-care. This uh, seventh step this spring is to try to make time, if you can, for friendships on a weekly basis. Now, what I want to tell you about friendships is that what we see often is a gender difference in how friendships are formed and maintained. Many times for women, I can use myself as an example, our friendships are very scripted. You know, I see one friend of mine for dinner once a month in Annapolis. I see another friend uh, locally here. We walk usually on Thursdays. Um, another friend I lunch with. I may see a couple other friends at an exercise class, and I see a professional friend at work whose office is right outside the kitchen, and when I warm up my microwavable lunch, I always talk to him, right? So I'm pretty scripted. 
men, for the most part, have these very organic relationships. You may not meet this friend for dinner in Annapolis like I would meet a girlfriend in Annapolis. However, what I want you to be aware of is that the relationships that you do have, maybe you just bump into somebody in the locker room after you guys both play racquetball on Thursdays, or maybe you just happen to uh, go to the cafeteria on the same days and usually sit together when you see each other. I want you to understand that those relationships, even if they are very organic and natural and very accidental, they're nonetheless incredibly important to your overall mental health. And so I want you to continue to make time and space for those relationships this spring. Because again, the research is clear. Overall health has a huge, there's a huge correlation between relationships and friendships and overall mental health. We can see in studies how long it takes people to have a heart attack the next time based on how many people came to see them in the hospital the first time. There are a lot of scientific studies out there to support this idea of the importance of friendship. And I know it's common sense, but also if you have these friendships, um, just remember that some friendships will uh, be professional and some will be personal, and both are just as important. You don't have to get everything from your professional friendships and everything from your personal friendships. It's okay if you have some that are only professional or only personal. They're just as important, and I hope you give them the care they deserve. And the last thing I want you to think about this spring that I teach my students is that you have to know yourself in order to know what recharges you. My colleague, who's really, really smart, always says, how can we know other people if we can't know ourselves? It's such a wise saying. If you're the kind of person, when I recharge, I love to exercise, I love to have dinner with my girlfriends, that's what recharges me. That may not be what recharges. You know, Mike likes to look at the iPad in the morning, you know, and read all these studies and uh, email his friends. That recharges him. Figure out what it is that recharges you and don't make it an accident. Don't feel like you're sneaking it in. This is about your own mental health and you need to make time and space once you figure out, hey, it's gardening. Whatever it is, I'll be gardening on Thursday from three to four and just try to stop me. Right? Figure out exactly what it is. And in the last 20 seconds, I'll just tell you that um, when it comes to self-care, you need to remember that it's either pay me now or pay me later. Because somehow, our bodies and our minds will catch up to the fact that we're not caring for ourselves, and you won't be able to stay in your profession as long as you'd like to. Um, thank you again for being here today. Okay, so we have a couple minutes for questions. Uh, we have Tracy's here, Margie's here, is Coach Stone here? We have Coach Blackman who has What's that downstairs? Or do you have or, questions for each other? Casey is here. Uh, anything pop up? Like, oh yeah, I got, a, I have a question about this. Coach. My youngest son. Aren't we? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know those. He's right at that age. Like he came home yesterday, and and he was convinced that he had to. Oh, we were. You were running off somewhere. We gotta go. We gotta go. I need a smoothie. Okay. So it starts on that little thing of making a smoothie, and what happens to the blender? Boom! Glass everywhere. So it's that special age where we're not gonna let him out in public. <laughs> you know? Not until we get the medication or he gets medication. We're not sure. My 26th year, my eight-year-old said, Dad, we need to talk. And I said, okay. And uh, so as, as I was putting him to bed, he said, I've been thinking. So when an eight-year-old starts to think, you know you got problems. He said, uh, bro, big brother, he, uh, he's down at the boathouse with you, and you know you guys are doing your thing, and that's your time with him, and I'm, I'm cool with that. Okay. He says, well, I've been thinking that you should only coach for two more years. And I said, oh, okay, is there a, 
reason why. And he said, well, yeah, you know, Bro graduates in two years, and he'll go off to college and do his thing. And I said, yeah. He says, well, in two years, I'm going to be 10. And I said, yeah, the math is correct. Where are you going with this, Josh? He said, well, I think when I turn 10, Dad, you should come home and play with me instead of those other boys. <laughs> so two years later, I took a six-year hiatus. Yeah. I just wanted to say that um, I have a daughter who's a senior in college and she plays softball. And her graduation this year falls on our state championship. So she said to me, and I have two other daughters who have gone through college. And I went to one graduation, didn't go to the other graduation because she was rowing at Vales and it happened to fall on the same day. So I was off the hook for that. So she said to me, Mom, Graduation is on May the 10th, on a Saturday. Um, I'm gonna give you a choice. You can either go to my graduation or will you come to senior night when we have our senior night softball game? And I said, okay, great, no brainer. I'll go to the softball game. And she went, what? <laughs> I said, you gave me a choice. If you wanted me to go to graduation, you should have said that. But clearly, clearly, it's very important to her that I go to graduation. So, Here you actually, her and I'll, I'll challenge her to you. but what you, and I've, and I've been debating it, what do I do, what do I do, and I think that your talk made me decide that, so thank you. Can, can I add my, yes. so here, I know what's coming. yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you know, it's a, it's a, it's a real tough one, um, because we invest so much with our teams, and we really care. We really care about the, the kids on our team. We want them to have the best experience. But then when we have our own kids, as, as Mike was saying also, it's tough. So here's what I'm looking at is on May, the exact date, May, May 30th, my oldest son who was here last year, Brooke, graduates high school. Well, that's also the same day for the, for the semis at the, I mean, at the heats and the, uh, at the NCAAs. Now that may not be, that may be a totally moot point. We may not be lucky enough and, and blessed enough to qualify. But if we were to qualify for that, you're like, well, what do you do? And one side of my brain said. He's not really asking what do you do. No, 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 but, but shh, do this. But, but one side of my brain is, well, it's, it's crystal clear. And the other side of my brain goes, yeah, it's crystal clear. And right in the middle, it's a splitting headache. But, the, you know, that's when you have to put on the big boy pants and the big girl pants and say, 10 years from now. That's that every decision adds up to something. Um, actually, we had a, um, when I was in high school and my senior year, we got to go down to nationals in Tennessee, and it was the first time our team had qualified in years um, to go down. And my coach had a wife who put her foot down and said, you are not going down to nationals. And uh, we went with the other coach, and um, I mean, as a team, we were so close with the other coaches as well that it almost didn't seem to have any type of, you know, like bearing on how our performance was. And he called us after the race to make sure, you know, each each qualifying race to make sure that we were doing well. Um, but it, it, as a team, like, I mean, you know, it's, it seems so devastating. You're like, but you're my coach, what are you supposed to do? But you're a father as well, and so like sometimes, I mean, so that you feel better about this, your team will get by. <laughs> <laughs> and and part, part of that is we, we think it's all about us. And as Margie said, it's not, it's, it's all about them. You know, we train, we train our team so that they can stand on their own two feet. And so it's the difference between a celebration of, of in this case, somebody who's graduating high school. Let's celebrate. That's a milestone in a, in a young man or a young woman's life. And can a team do really well without you? Well, last year, our team qualified for the NCAAs. I was in bed as they qualified because... I had a health issue going on with teeth. And they called me up and they said, hey, we just qualified. I was so looped on whatever it was. <laughs> I was, I didn't even, it was like, out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
it was like I had dementia or something. It was, it was bad. So th I think there does come that point where we think we're instrumental. It's uh, us. every Mother's Day for 30 years. You're helping me. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but on the calendar, it said Mother's Day regatta, number one. Number two, every mother that was there got a flower, okay? Every mother, all of the parents and that. The mothers, we had a Mother's Day dinner Saturday night for Sunday. And it made it to the point where my wife, and I've been married 42 years, my wife wouldn't miss it. So she helped me make the decision, but we realized what the importance of that day was, and it was all about mom. And my talk to my athletes on Saturday night was the same as Mike Tatey talked to his crews before they won the gold medal in Athens. He said, your mothers are going to love you whether you win or lose, but they'll love you a lot more with a gold medal around you. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Tady. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we have one more. <coughs> Somebody? Anybody want to throw into the mix? I feel like Jerry Springer. Let it out. Come on, folks. <laughs> And so I coach a novice master's program. And, um, you know, the, so the adults come in, they're anywhere between 25 and 55-ish years old. And I work with them for, let's say, um, three months. And then there's Y Island Regatta. How many of you guys know what Y Island Regatta is, right? 13 miles around Y Island. And I have these novices who, like, don't really know what's going on. <laughs> and I tell them it's going to be the best thing ever, and it's going to be this amazing experience, and it's going to be really hard, but when you come back, everything's going to be a piece of cake, right? My plan is to always go with them, though, and be there with them. And for some reason this year, I couldn't be there. I honestly couldn't tell you why I wasn't there this year, but I, I, I didn't get around to telling them that I wasn't going to be there <laughs> until, like, the week of. And they had like minor palpitations. They're like, what? You're not going to be with us and we're going to go do this amazing, huge race? And I said, yeah, but you're going to be fine. You've got each other. You know what to do. Go. And they went and they had an unbelievable time. Nice. And they took charge, right? Instead of always being dependent on me, which they had been for three months, I said, fly, right? You say, just let go. Because. Go be a rower. Don't, you don't, you're not going to have me on the water anyway. And they came back with just this whole new concept of what rowing was and that they could be in charge and didn't always need me feeding them information. And that was support. great for them and yeah. great for you. And that's a really good example of that. Anybody else? You guys have these conversations. We're talking about staying in the profession. Human services is brutal. We're talking about staying in the profession for a long time and all the things you need to do on a weekly basis to do that. That's a great. Uh, if I can add, my doctoral thesis was on the impact of a rowing season on rowing coaches. Big seller, sold two copies, right? <laughs> but basically what I discovered, and I, I <laughs> I'm not going there. Um, I'm sorry, old, I can't hear. Um, I, I followed 100 coaches, 105 coaches, over the course of a season. And what we found out was that the coaches went through the same amount of stress measured by a valid scale that uh, many in the health services, nurses, teachers, uh, doctors, dentists, at the same level. And dentists are off the chart in terms of stress and, and the impact of their job. It's not to be taken lightly the price we pay to coach. It's a significant price. And I think Tracy's talk hopefully resonated with somebody. Uh, we'll be up at the dining hall here. And, and this is, these are conversations that are great to have over lunch. Not that it'll spur the appetite, but it's, it's a great time to network. I'm going to challenge you at one thing at lunch. Not to get there. That's, you can make that. The challenge is sit with somebody you don't know. Introduce, your someone, introduce yourself to somebody that you don't know. Ask questions to somebody you don't know. It's a great learning opportunity. Uh, crab cakes, and if you get up there and it's not working for you, let me know. Coach. We're all going to meet in the lobby so everyone has time to get their coats on and everything like that. We'll meet downstairs in the lobby. I will be the person that introduces you to the people that you don't know. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And we're back here, started back at quarter of one.